Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another edition of Authors at Google. Uh, we're very excited to have uh, Renee Montaigne with us today, uh, co-host of Morning Edition. I don't know how many of you are actually up at that time of day. Um, so maybe I don't know. I'm usually am. So. Um, as I'm driving to work, I usually listen to the show, so I'm very excited. Uh, the book is, this is NPR, uh, The First 40 Years. Um, it's great uh, for me to be able to put some faces to the voices that I hear on NPR uh, every day. Uh, and it's great to hear some of the stories, uh, you know, all the exciting people they meet, all the great events they cover. So uh, with no further introduction, uh, Renee Montaigne. Thank you very much, um, and thank you, uh, Mike, for the introduction. I hope, I, I'm, I'm imagining those in this room probably um, do listen to Morning Edition, or you certainly listen to NPR shows, which is what this book is about. Um, and in, in order, in fact, to talk about the book is to talk about NPR. Uh, but I just have to say one thing, which I will say to anybody, I love Google. I can't, and I actually, it's almost hard to imagine living without it and doing what we do without it. And one of the interesting things about doing this book, which of course now it's the 41st, this now it's uh, 41 years of NPR. Um, when we were doing this book, like not last year, but the year before, um, and each of, there, there are four decade chapters, and they were given to four different uh, authors to do the chapters. Um, it was such an amazing walk down, you know, like remembering what life was like without Google, basically, and, and everything else that's come onto the scene um, in the last, uh, you know, sometimes five years, you know, the last 10, the last decade anyway. And, and things like, you know, we now have, I'm, I'm jumping ahead here, but I just want to say, we now have, um, we now have people we interview, we ask them to record themselves on their iPhones. And it's like something out of like the future to be able to say there's a microphone and it, the quality is unless you really screw up you know, will be really good. And do you mind just like recording yourself? I, I mean, that, that I, I couldn't have made that one up, you know, even 10 years ago. So, um, so I'm anyway delighted to talk about the book because I think for those of you, and, and there is, I was thinking maybe it would be a group where nobody would have been born by the <laughs> when NPR started. But in fact, um, some of you look like you were born back then. So some of you might recognize some of, you know, what I'm um, going to talk about. Uh, my, uh, as I say, there were four, lots of contributors. Um, an introduction, Susan Stamberg, Cokie Roberts. Susan talks about NPR. I wasn't there, but in 1971, in uh, May 3rd, when the show went on the air, in the weeks leading up to that, they had meetings. Uh, this is, this is how NPR began. They had meetings. They all sat on the floor, figured out what the mission was, and you know m many things. You know that they were t as they were trying to literally bring into being this entity, um, National Public Radio, and they sat on the floor. And and Susan had told me that story once or twice, and I I never realized that until she wrote her introduction that the reason that they sat on the floor wasn't because they all were a bunch of sort of hippies, but because there were no chairs. <laughs> and there had was that you know they hadn't literally bought the chairs yet when the <laughs> when all things considered first went on the air, and um, so there are these contributions by all kinds of people um, and and as I say the four chapters and for those of you who have books I'll tell you literally if you want to know what's say my writing or Ari Shapiro's writing it's the white pages <laughs> and then all the rest are um, are maybe really the best part are these inserts, um, the sidebars, which are personal stories from a whole range of people, how they got to NPR, what they did. Um, uh, the, 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 there's also transcripts, which are nice, and, and they picked ones that did work on the page, but it's kind of interesting to see some of this stuff written down when the whole essence of what we do is for the ear and is in storytelling mode. So. Um, I'm just going to begin with my own chapter, which is the 90s, which is an era of NPR that was a great sort of turning point for NPR. I mean, I think it's safe to say that up until the end of the 80s, NPR was a well-kept secret. I mean, it was, um, well, you know, uh, what, what's that expression for when, like, a few people know about something and they're really dedicated, but uh, the world at large isn't that familiar. I traveled through Texas to do a story on a tornado where you could travel for seven, eight hours and never pick up an NPR uh, station. And also through Nebraska in 
1988, where whole chunks, the whole western side of Nebraska, you could not pick up an NPR station. And that all changed in about two or three years. There's no place you can go now and not, it, theoretically, if you're not right in the mountains, you know, pick up an NPR station. And one of the things um, <laughs> that changed it, actually, was our foreign coverage. We were very, to the degree that NPR was known, people knew Cokie Roberts. I mean, she made her name on NPR before she went over to ABC. Uh, they knew Linda Wertheimer. They knew the people who covered Washington. And, and to the degree that it was known and very respected by the time, you know, I was freelancing at that time, um, it was because of that sort of coverage. That and a certain amount of reaching out to the small towns of the country uh, in innovative ways. <laughs> because whereas we now have stations like KPCC that have full service uh, news departments, in those days, pretty much, we didn't even have that. I mean, we had a Washington contingent, and we had, in the 80s, um, you know, I can't give you an exact count, but there were maybe 10 staff reporters in the country, maybe. I mean, I can remember, Scott, there was America uh, Rodriguez here in Los Angeles. That was her name. She, she went on to other things, but America Rodriguez. There was Scott Simon in Chicago. There was, I mean, I, you, can, you could name them practically. In fact, I might be wrong. There might have only been five national correspondents. And there was no foreign, well, there was one foreign correspondent, and that was, it was Robert Siegel in, in a chunk of the 80s, um, because we had a location, and still do, although it's not Bush House anymore. We had, a, we had a studios in Bush House as of, I think, 1979 or 80. Um, Sylvia Pajoli, for instance, I actually chatted with her. I ch had the fun of talking with people that I know very well. But I, you know, I rarely see, because NPR, all our friends are people in other places. You become friends with somebody that you have never lived in the same town um, or city. And Sylvia is one of them, a longtime friend who I don't ever hardly get to sit and have an in-depth conversation with. But I did for the book, which was fun. And I said, Sylvia, when did you actually go on staff? And Sylvia said, let's put it this way they'd already named the restaurant after me. And what she meant was that um, she was so famous, I mean, Sylvia Pajoli, you know, she was so part of the fabric of NPR, of the sound of NPR, that you couldn't believe that she was still um, on a contract. I mean, not on a contract till 1993. And she'd been, go, you know, 10 years working with NPR. And the restaurant was this restaurant in Salem, Oregon called Pajoli's. There were actually two at one point. And she was, like, already the sort of thing, what's the New York Times more recently um, was talking about something that happened to the Vatican and said, holy Pajoli, it's blah 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 It was a jokey thing about the Vatican. So, you know, it's almost impossible to imagine how well NPR covered the country when we didn't have reporters out in the country. And we had some um, freelance, a lot of freelance people. I was freelance. I mean, there was no hope of getting, I was in New York, no hope of getting a job in the 80s because there were, like I said, there was Margot Adler. <laughs> Same people were, were like, they're gonna have, they're gonna have to die. You know, thank God. I mean, they didn't. They didn't. And there, there's three people still there who were there back in the, back in the 80s. But when they asked me to do the 90s, it was kind of a, a great thing because I had just come on staff officially in 88. And I, as the host, the co-host with Robert Siegel of All Things Considered, when Susan Stamberg and Noah Adams left. Um, and, and I did that for a couple of years. And then starting in 90, I started going to South Africa. And so I had a taste of what our, the new level that NPR was going to reach when foreign coverage became one of our best um, you know, projects. And it also, the foreign coverage that NPR provides for some parts of the country is all the foreign coverage they, that anybody's going to get there. I went to South Africa to cover the release of Nelson Mandela, uh, you know, biggest, one of the biggest stories of the decade, actually one of the biggest stories, the Mandela story of the, of the century. Um, and I got there the day he, literally the day he was released, um, and I remember it was raining, and I started the chapter with that, it was raining in Soweto. Which, is a, which in Africa, I, I was soon to learn, um, a positive, you know, rain is considered a gift. And it was considered very, very uh, propitious, you know, very, very uh, good sign. And um, I got there the day that he was 
released. And the idea was NPR was turning more and more to trying to be there for these big events. We had been there for the fall of the Berlin Wall. They sent Robert Siegel um, just the year before. We had been there, uh, we had people in Poland when Solidarity elected, uh, Solidarity prevailed, and they elected Lech Wałęsa as president. We had been, all this stuff was stunningly over about a two-year period, the world literally was changing. And at that moment in time, what was happening was the Cold War was ending and walls were coming down. So it was really a moment that's <coughs> actually almost impossible to imagine now of such hope. A little like the Arab Spring, only with much more, how can I say, much more for potential for positive outcomes like in Poland and Russia, and uh, this is Russia before the oligarchs, Russia before Putin. You know, this was like a new Russia emerging, it seemed. And um, to give you a feel for how it worked then, I um, showed, up, showed up, got myself in a car, got on the left side of the road, <laughs> started driving, where the big networks were in um, a four-star hotel downtown, uh, a downtown, by the way, that was soon to sort of disappear and become very African. But at that exact moment in town, it was very white, and it was called the uh, Golden Mile. So all the fancy restaurants, because, you know, apartheid, right? Obviously, the, the, the wealth was downtown, like it would be in a normal city. Well, NPR, <laughs> NPR had us out in the suburbs, um, and we were in this little hotel that was really a salesman's hotel. And I don't know if you know Offer Connors, but they're like the, I don't know what you would say, well, they're the white people of South Africa, but Afrikaners in particular, they would be out in the countryside and in small towns. So it was like Afrikaner salesmen um, who were living, staying there, and here we flow in, and uh, there were five of us, and we set up shop, and the only way to get out was through the hotel uh, phone system, which meant that if somebody called you, like, say you were trying to set up an interview, you would call out, and of course, most people in South Africa did not have landlines. Not just the black people, a lot of white people didn't either, because they just didn't have a good phone system. There was no such thing as cell phones. The political people and poli had, were pretty sophisticated. They had, um, uh, what do you call, um, pagers. And, and you know, you, all, all you could do is put your number down and cross your fingers, that they would page you back or call you back. But in our case, it went through a hotel. A hotel system where, you know, if you were out, you wouldn't get the call. If you were upstairs and they knocked on your door and you were in the bathroom, you wouldn't get the call. I mean, it was like really hard to set up an interview. So basically, you had to go to the place, set the interview up, and hope they were there when you came back for the appointed time. Or if they were there, hope they were willing to talk to you. Um, it didn't hurt me too much because I was there to cover people. Not, not the Mandela people, not the, the ANC, not the African National Congress. But when we wanted to file, or had to file, and I'm gonna actually have to look this up, it's called something called, a, what you filed on was something called a Comrex. And our, um, Vince Muse, our engineer, set it all up, and it was one of these things that, that uh, you would do your, you would read it, you would uh, talk into it, and then it would slow, not a time thing, but it, they stretched it out, and then they, closed it back up at the other end, which meant that it didn't always sound right. I mean, it sometimes sounded sort of slightly off in this funny way, but that was the best you could do. Um, and as for the rest, um, you were on your own. Like, you got in your car and went out and found people. And I used to do this. I had a technique, and I was in and out of the country for the next four years through uh, Mandela's um, inauguration and, and lived there at times for like as much as a year. And um, at all times, I just would go into the townships, even there are these township wars that grew up, and there was two years, and it was pretty serious business. It doesn't sound like anything now, but they were fighting each other and killing each other in the townships, and, and it was a strange sort of war. It was between the Zulu and Kata Freedom Party, which was ethnic, and the ANC, which wasn't ethnic, but uh, this was a power struggle. And so these young guys, um, comrades, they called themselves on the ANC side, and you'll probably remember them from the 80s, you know, kids who would be out there protesting and um, they were young young kids it was almost like a children's revolution in that sense they were young teenagers and whatnot they would um, I would just get I would find somebody and get them in my car and, and like Soweto had two million people it was a township of Soweto had two million people it did not have a single street sign it did not have you know if you wanted to go somewhere there were a couple of things like a Baraguana hospital and you know there were a couple of 
things, but it was this sprawling township and you would go in and there was like nothing else you could do but have some local person take you where you wanted to go and everyone needed a ride. I mean, I'd be the only car driving along and you know, I'd look out at somebody likely and often it would be these young guys, you know, kids that wanted to get in your car. And, and so they came, but when it came time to filing, <laughs> this is how we filed. There were two ways to file. And this went on the whole time I was there, through 94, right through the inauguration. When it came time to filing, you, you had two choices. If you had a really, really nice feature story and you wanted to put it on in nice tape, I would, um, I had rigged up in my bedroom um, a quilt over a chair so that I, to, for sound purposes, and I would sit under it and I swear to God, I never got it right ever in all that time. And it would fall on my head all the time. But you would put this quilt up and get down and you know do my tracks, put them on a cassette, send the cassette. Um, <laughs> sometimes I, I actually had a machine that I could edit on, so I'm not saying I always send it this way. I would often edit it to my satisfaction, and then put you know put it on reel to reel. Um, but it all started with a cassette. That was how I recorded it, and then the cassettes of my ta my tape. So I would put it not together. I couldn't produce it, but I would put the the reels together, and then we had an arrangement with the BBC where there would be a pickup at by five o'clock or every day at five o'clock in the afternoon. So you had to be there. I would knock on your door, take your tape, take it down to the airport. They would put it on a plane along with the BBC stuff. The BBC would collect it and get it through customs in London. They would get it over to the Bush House. And then at Bush House, they would send it by satellite to NPR. <laughs> so if you wanted to sound good, two days from, from finish to delivery after you'd done everything. If you couldn't afford to do that and you wanted to send a piece or talk to them, be interviewed by NPR, and I didn't do a lot of what you hear now. In fact, I probably did one. The, you hear now talks with people, Dolores Garcia Navarro, right in the middle of, uh, you know, Tiana, uh, not Tiananmen Square, right in the middle of, um, back in the 90s here, back in the middle of, what? well, I'm thinking, well, she was also in Egypt, but, um, yeah. yes, thank you. Um, Tahrir Square, right? Um, but Lourdes Garcia Navarro in the middle of Libya. I'll, hey, you know, Lulu, how are you doing? You know, and often, by the way, we do say, take care of yourself and things that you don't hear on the air, you know, at the end. Believe me, we're highly aware people are standing with bullets going by and talking to you. Well, then, you, the only way you could talk to someone, which is why I rarely did any of those kinds of conversations, in fact, I never did, was you, um, you <laughs> on your tape recorder, you um, put, you, I know some of you won't even know what this is, you took, you unscrewed the telephone and there are two little prongs, right? And then you had alligator clips. You know, have you ever heard of alligator clips? They're little electrical things. They're called them alligator clips because they look like that, but they're really small. You would put it on one, of, uh, how does it work? Oh God, I know. Yes, you, I can't remember anymore. You would alligator clip it into the telephone and, and attach that to the microphone, no, to the, to the, uh, jeez, recorder. recorder, but there were, yeah, two clips, and it went into the recorder. That's right. Then you would set the recorder on, on record and pause. Thank you. Reco you've got the idea, right? Record and pause. And then you would read, which meant you couldn't talk to somebody because the headset is all you could, technically. You could hold it up with these alligator clips, but you're talking through your microphone, so the sound was much, much better going through the telephone. And, um, or you would record it and just send everything. You know, just record on cassette and just send everything, but it never sounded that good. It sounded like telephone tape. You would send your tape that way, too, if you had to. And, um, I, I mean, I'm trying to think of all the other insane sounding ways in which we communicated. Um, once I was in Congo, in what was then Zaire, in Kinshasa, and it was the very beginning of the end, although Mobutu hung in there for about eight more years and five million more people dead. But at that moment in time, he was, had been a dictator for like 30 years, and, and there were riots. And so, <laughs> you'll appreciate, Natalie Kasika, by the way, who I should introduce our executive producer of Morning Edition, she just flew in with her daughters for a vacation, and she came here on the way from the airport. But you would like this, um, we had a, we had a, um, a foreign editor, her name was Kati Simon, at the time she ran the foreign desk, and uh, was really building the foreign desk. It, it, she called up once and said, she said to me, um, there, you, know, you know about the riots. Well, you know, I didn't have wire services because it was too expensive. And also the phone lines were so bad that the wire services oftentimes didn't print very well in South Africa. So they just, NPR said, we're not gonna spend hundreds of dollars. You just call 
us and we'll read it to you. And so we used to, I used to call the newscast and they would read me what was of importance in South Africa as I was covering the whole country. So clearly I covered it with features for the most part and um, not a daily, daily thing. But she called me, there's riots and she said, and they're talking about, and there's the fewest uh, uh, fewest Europeans in Zaire that have their, uh, than have been there since the beginning of colonialism. And the reason for that was they'd all fled. These are like three generations of Greeks and you know various people from Eastern Europe and people who had really been there for, for 100 years, but they didn't have citizenship and people were leaving their factories and, and getting the hell out of there, you know? So she said, you know, we hear there's gonna be a bloodbath. How soon can you get there? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, let's see. <laughs> I didn't get my yellow fever shot, but I think I could make it by, you know, sundown. But in fact, well, the problem was no planes were going in. They had stopped all the international traffic. So I ended up going into Brazzaville, which is in the other Congo across the river, and um, got what was truly the last at that moment in time, the last ferry over. And this was, and I had to, these two Greek guys who had fled a month before came on the plane with me. I say Greek, but they were, like I said, third generation. They were going back to see their factory. So they were, it was so lucky for me because they spoke English. And um, I spoke French, but not, they speak French there too in the Congo, but not so, you know, great. And so they were like, okay, okay, we're gonna get this ferry, and they helped me get the ferry, and, um, and, and they said, you better stuff all that equipment so I get on the ferry like I'm like nine months pregnant. Like, no, and they had heard, they had some kind of walkie-talkie, and they'd heard that people were stealing everything off of everybody as soon as the ferry landed on the other end, because it was quite chaotic. And, um, but somehow, I don't know, they were around me and we sort of plunged through. And we got there and we went straight to their factory and they took me before the hotel and they, uh, the factory, I, we, they opened the door, the factory was empty, stripped of everything, electrical, everything. And just that deep in, in slippers, in uh, uh, flip flops. Because people had run so fast out of there that, that they ran out of their shoes. It was a stunning sight, and I wish I'd had an iPhone with a, with a camera. Uh, at that moment, was, you know, I, I mean, I didn't. I go to the hotel, and it's pretty much, you know, water for an hour a day. All the reporters were put on the fifth floor, pretty empty. I mean, but still, this fancy intercontinental hotel, and <laughs> there were these guys walking around with what looked like, you know, bowling balls on their ears. They were walking around with these big black things that they were doing this, and I, you know, I'm like, they and what is that and they were the, like early adopters of um, phones you know these the kind of things I think people did have on their car in their cars in 1991 but they were carrying them around and I said well who are they and they were and they, they were diamond smugglers very fancily beautifully dressed with these and you're like yeah that's who has all the equipment right <laughs> you know the diamond smugglers they figured it out they needed it they're working it but for the rest of us it was the same thing you had to go to people's houses and, and set it up but um, but one time I tried to make I had to make a phone I got ill and I was supposed to be there three weeks but I had to get out and there really wasn't a way to get out it wasn't easy I didn't know how to get a flight out of Brazzaville, so I tried to call NPR. I did call NPR and say I needed a, a flight just a little earlier, just a simple change. Would be simple today, um, but in the, then it took three days for the phone call to come back to me. You know, there was a, a business room, and you went in and you put in a, a, a call. I would like to put in a call to this number. Three days later, they knocked on my door and said, which was okay, I didn't need to get out that fast. <laughs> Three days later, I knocked on the door and said, your call's waiting for you downstairs. So I go down and I talk fast because I knew it was expensive. But I never knew how expensive it was until I turned, they, I got billed at the end of the, it was like a nine minute call and it was 300 and change dollars. <laughs> that, that, you know, and, and, you know, and the way I got out was it was a little Christian flight, uh, like a one seater or two seater, I mean, room for one more. And um, they didn't organize it. The hotel organized so, because there was no way to get out. You know, there was no ferry running across the river. So, I mean, the way that they do it now, you hear all those stories sort of as you're going along, but these were things that happened without anybody um, knowing what you're going through because there was no communication. Um, I wanted to I open it up for questions. I wanted to, but I do want to do one thing. I, I want to play, God, it might take six minutes, right? Do you, you all know Rwanda? 
right? You know what happened in 1994 in Rwanda. Half a million people killed, a, a terrible slaughter of the mostly ethnic Hutus, uh, Tutsis killed by Hutus. Um, so I'm going to play a four minute story and then open it up for questions. And the, the reason I want to play it is it's a radio story by one of our reporters, Michael Scholar, who um, was with us, up with me, or down rather, in uh, Johannesburg covering the Mandela uh, inauguration, the vote and the inauguration. And the vote took a really long time to count so that it delayed like three weeks what we thought would be done in a day or two. It, 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 it was delayed right up to the day of the inauguration. And so Michael, here's the thing with foreign correspondents, they, they run when into where everyone else is running out of. And he was desperate to get back to Rwanda because he was out of Nairobi. And, and I was desperate to stay and cover the inauguration because I loved South Africa and was there. So we made a deal where I stayed for the inauguration, which was nice. Anyway, he, um, Michael is the second one, is the second one? He, um, he sent this story very much in the way I've just described, 1994. He could not, you could not have heard this story until a week after it happened, uh, maybe three days maybe three and a half days and it's a very long it's 21 minute story i'm not going to play 21 minutes but there is one part part of these the idea of trying to explain in a book what we did uh, and what you heard on the radio and this was the, i wanted to use this because it was one of these really stunning stories he got some big awards for it too he was there ahead of a lot of people the difference between what you hear and what what you'll see if you see any quotes on the page because it's all in the sound in a way profound as his story was and what what's happened is and i'll just do the setup it's probably taking me two minutes to do the setup but let me quickly just do the setup and that was that he had gone in we, all this killing had happened but it was really hard to cover it was really hard for people to understand it was happening if you wonder sometimes why people didn't intervene earlier like the united states it honestly went fast. And it was weird because it was retail killing. People were not killed by bombs or rockets or IEDs. They were killed, they were killed one on one with machetes and versions of machetes. So this, you know, six week period, the this Hutu groups managed to rampage across the country and kill by hand somewhere in the neighborhood of half a million people. So that wasn't really getting out very well. And um, at the point at which people didn't know much about it, this story came on the air. I drove in from the north and entered the part of Rwanda held by the Tutsi-led rebel army, the Rwandan Patriotic Front, or RPF. The RPF insisted I travel with two soldiers for my own protection, they said, though that hardly seemed necessary. The countryside was empty. We passed miles of deserted villages, fields of sorghum, corn, beans, and bananas with no one to harvest them. Eerie, since Rwanda is one of the most densely populated countries in the world. Sometimes the car would fill with the smell of rotting flesh, and we would notice corpses lying in a field or by the side of an abandoned house. Those who had been killed here were almost all from the Tutsi ethnic group, like the rebel soldiers with me. Other Rwandans, those of the majority Hutu group, had fled, afraid the RPF would kill them in revenge for the slaughter of Tutsis. But occasionally, I found places crowded with people, people too fearful to go back to their villages and homes. In a town called Gahini, 30 miles east of the capital, Kigali, the crowd around me contained old women, some younger women, small children, but very few men. And as I asked why they were here, they started to lift their clothes. This woman is showing us her legs and arms. They have raised, long wounds on them. They look like maybe they're, they're burns. Those are burns. In, in her nose, there's kind of a, a crease now that's healed over and a scar. She said that was a spear that went in through her nose. And here's a little girl in a pretty flower dress lifting up her skirt to show burn marks on her, her knees and legs and a, a bandage. And here's a little boy who has lifted his shirt to show a wound from a spear right in the middle of his back between his shoulders. Mainly the boys. Even, even the babies. Why? Pourquoi? 
in order to get rid of the, the Tutsi race. Yes. <laughs> the planned killing of a race, genocide. Foreign nations have been hesitant to label the Rwandan massacres genocide because that would force them to act. But the evidence that genocide has been occurring here is hard to ignore. Those in Gahini told me to go to Kerubamba a few miles away to see for myself what had happened to their mostly Tutsi families and friends who, like them, had sought refuge in a church there, but who never made it out again. As I drove up to a set of orange brick church buildings, I had to clamp a bandana tightly over my nose and mouth. The stench was unbearable. Outside the church, there are maybe two or three dozen bodies. And in the heat here in Rwanda, many of the bodies are already almost fully decomposed. You can see some skulls, some backbones. Um, there are what seem to be women in brightly colored, colored clothing, as well as children lying about. This is amidst uh, what is a very beautiful area of eucalyptus trees and pine trees. There are bodies scattered all over the church. The blood is on the floor is so thick it's dried to kind of a muddy brown dust that may be in some places a quarter of an inch thick. Most of the bodies are blackened and decomposing. They, some lie on mattresses, some on the floor, some are covered with blankets. By the altar there are probably about 30 bodies clustered around. One is the body of, of an infant with the parents, it seems, on either side. There's a suitcase that is open and kind of torn apart in front of the altar. On the floor of the church, you can see baskets, plastic uh, water cans, pails, combs, brushes, sandals, sneakers, tins of food, a bottle of talcum powder, the windows, stained glass windows on either side are broken. There are wooden pews that have been thrown against them. Above the whole scene, uh, above the altar, is a small wooden statue of Christ with one hand raised. Gee, I'm even, I'm sorry, I'm even like, whew. Uh, you know, what happened there, and happens, I think, on NPR regularly, and, and many times in a much happier fashion, um, is that th there are things you can't even imagine, in this case, too hellish to imagine, but that when you hear something like this, it's, it, it becomes really impossible to, to not think about it or to ignore it. And that's a particular slice of what, of what we do, that is bringing it to you. But as long as it took him to get this on the radio, it had to have. I mean, I wasn't there talking to Mike about it, but Michael about it, but three, four days. I just know that's five days maybe. He had to get out of that place. He had to, there was no, um, there were no satellite phones or, or anything remotely like that. A computer, he probably had no computer with him. Probably did it all by hand on a paper. Um, it still was very, very immediate. You were still unfortunately walking with him through this, uh, through this space, this, this, this little bit of hell. Um, I, this is only another minute and then I'll just turn it to questions. This is what happens today. And this is from the last time I was in Afghanistan. And um, it's only, like I say, it's a minute, 20 seconds. Um, but it's actually about five, six minutes on the air, seven or eight minutes this on the This is Morning air. Edition from NPR News. I'm David Green. And I'm Steve Inskeep. Good morning. An attack on Kabul, Afghanistan is over. Attackers took control of a building that had a clear line of fire down to the U.S. Embassy and NATO headquarters in the heart of the city, and it's taken 20 hours for Afghan forces to finally clear that building. It is inside that building that we have found NPR's Renee Montaigne and Quill Lawrence. Hello to you both. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, Steve. What do you see there? Quill and I are both standing on the 10th floor of this 12-story high-rise here in the middle of Kabul. And um, not too far from us are the bodies of four of the attackers. There's two more bodies on the staircase as it goes down. We're looking around, and this was clearly the, the site of a, of a huge fight. We're told this was where the fight was the fiercest, right here in this room. 
the walls are pockmarked with all kinds of holes uh, from the incoming fire from Afghan and international community forces. As you said, you know, the target was the American embassy and looking out of one of these big open windows, there's a clear line of sight to the embassy. It's a perfect target from this distance for something like a rocket propelled grenade. I mean, it went on and on, but that was like, not live actually, although it could have been, uh, but an hour, 45 minutes before it went on there, maybe even 15 minutes before it went on the air. So that, like, that's 20 years right there. It's, you know, they're 18. Um, you know, as you can see, I could go on, but I won't. I won't. <laughs> there must be things you want to know about NPR that um, I haven't got to. So let me just stop for a moment and ask for questions. Uh, is there really an NPR voice? Do you all take elocution lessons? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Because it, there's a very distinctive accent, an NPR, a received pronunciation of sorts. Uh, well, you know, I think it's, it seems to my ear just the opposite. It sounds like some people ought to take elocution <laughs> lessons. Um, I mean, we do not discriminate against people who have adenoidal voices and, you know, um, high voices and who talk sing with a sing song. And um, I, I think the, only, the difference between us, I think, and commercial radio, um, even to this day, is I think we don't, we, we actually do employ voice, voice coaches once in a while, but really people get hired in, and whoever they really are uh, is how they sound on the radio, and I think why maybe in a weird way it sounds the same is because I think what's the same about it is everybody has, speaks in their natural voices. Uh, their voices are, I mean, my, I'm obviously talking a lot faster, and I know I don't make an effort, it's just happens. I put on headsets, I'm talking in front of a mic, and I can hear myself, you know, and I don't, didn't used to like that, but if, if I hear myself, I slow down, but I don't like sit there thinking, you know, slow down, I just slow down. But for the most part, my voice is my voice, Steven Skeep's voice is Steven Skeep's. Sometimes you get a Noah Adams, who of course was with us from the beginning practically, um, Bob Edwards, uh, Robert Siegel to some extent, with these low, deep, maybe traditional sounding voices. But I, I, I sort of think the opposite. I think what's the same is we all sound like ourselves. So that's so different that it's an NPR sound. If, 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 does that make sense? Well, that the contrast with BBC, which used to sound like oh. NPR and has taken a deliberate attempt to emphasize regional. Accent. I know, yes, I know, I hear it too. I hear that when I get up at 11, they play uh, a PM at night. Uh, they play um, the BBC, the morning show on KPCC, so it's like my morning edition. Yeah, and they, they're going with Scottish accents, they have some, you can clearly, the, like Africa, I'm not sure what country is, but some, you know, sort of slightly African accents, and yeah, they're presenters. Yeah. They're, they're allowing, yeah, they didn't used to, right? It was, what is it, received accent? Look, Madalika's from London. Uh, she's from London. When did that switch happen? Uh -oh. Do you even remember? You don't follow. Well after I was looking for a job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because Somebody they wouldn't have hired name. you. They wouldn't have hired me. Madalika Sika would not have been on the air 20 years ago. Yeah, it happened way after that. And I think it also happened because the BBC started going into more regional coverage around the country. So Scotland and North England and those kinds of places. So you had a shot at making it to the national coverage of the BBC. But certainly my people were never on the air when, when but I was they are now. And they are now. And I, just one thing about NPR, I mean, I think that, um, I, I think Renee's right that a lot of our reporters sound exactly the way they are when you meet them. So a Fabia Quist often jumps out of the radio at you, and that is exactly how mm -hmm. she sounds when you meet her. You know, Sylvia is the same, Louisa. We do have a fair amount of Brit-type voices on our air. Yeah, um, British. Well, yeah, British, so like Amphibia is and, Ghan uh, Ghana Lynn. by birth, but, but raised or educated in, in Britain. Yeah, so I think that, so. yeah, you, I, I think that when you, if you met our, our radio voices in person, you knew, you would know exactly who they are because their voice would be so recognizable to you, whereas I think in a lot of commercial television or commercial radio, there's a voice you have to kind of portray. Um, and there, we do try and get the accents right when we're saying foreign words. We agonize over that. <laughs> we try. <laughs> we, we, um, we also fix the show. <laughs> I mean, there's a first-run show here in California. It's at 2 a.m. So 
really hardly anyone hears it. It starts at five on the East Coast, and so you know we're on that schedule. And uh, luckily, in a way, for my my area, my region, um, you know, if you really get something wrong, like of what you mispronounce someone's name or you you get it really wrong, you have a shot at like doing it another time and redoing it. But you know, I'll tell you one thing real quickly. People also often look. People say that they don't look like. People always say it to me honestly every time I meet someone. Oh, I thought you'd be taller. This happened four days ago. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, but uh, or blonder, even though this is darkened hair, so I am a little blonder than this. But. Um, uh, Many times people do look that way. I, it, it, there was a slight mistake in the book where they took something out and then collapsed something and it, fine, you know, it was too late to fix it. It was actually me saying this where I, it was attributed to a listener once said about Sylvia Pajoli. Uh, and they took what the listener really said out and left me saying it, uh, whatever. But Sylvia Pajoli always sounded to me before I met her, because I met her after I'd heard her, like uh, uh, that she would have like uh, a 1940s jacket on and a fedora <laughs> with a, and long dark hair swept back and a, with a press stuck in the, in the you know in the ribbon, and she doesn't wear the hat or the press <laughs> sign, but she really does look like or did used to when I first met her look like a 40s you know like hello I'm you know reporting you know, like Edward Armour only female you know I'm reporting from you know roof of London during that and she did look like that you know she smokes she's really like <laughs> like that and it kind of just fitted exactly so doesn't mean um, oh yeah. gosh so yes I was wondering actually so at Google you know a lot of us are engineers and so we become tech support for our family and friends right so I was kind of wondering with you guys do you do you become kind of like a family or a friend sort of news reporter source and you, you go to a party and everybody kind of expects you to to do the thing that you do on the yeah. radio in person <laughs> yeah they do they really do I hadn't thought of that I've never even asked that but yeah mm. fill us in on Libya you know or something or yeah and you say I can I mean what I do I mean, I'm secondhand, but I'm so focused on the latest that, it, that it's good to ask me. It is good to ask me those questions. <laughs> I can fill you in. My husband always says, did you hear about the robots? Like, yeah, we put it on the show this week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, did you hear? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks to me, you heard about <laughs> You spoke about the 90s as being a critical decade of transformation. How did the intensifying um, congressional attacks on NPR and public broadcasting uh, figure into the, the changes? Back then, the original Newt stuff. Yes. Seriously, yes. the Newt Gingrich was, at, was after us. Yes, I had to do a little segment on it. Who, by the way, he, he might not fess up to it now, but I, I used it because I fact-checked it. I saw the speech that he said this in, who said uh, in the early 2000s, you know, I don't know, either NPR's gotten less liberal or I've gotten more relaxed, whatever the quote was. Um, oh, here it is. I've turned to it by accident. Newt, Newt Gingrich. He, they tried to what they called zero, zero out public, uh, public um, well, public broadcasting. They were, but they really ha dislike NPR. Uh, it's not all public broadcasting. They, they're fine with most of what goes on PBS because PBS has no, they have no, no strong um, news, they, they, they wrote the one news show, basically, and then the wonderful, oh my god, I'm blocking on it, the wonderful um, documentary, um, Frontline. Frontline. But, you know, really, half an hour a day kind of thing, and we're all, as you know, news. Uh, so they've never liked NPR, and it used to be called in the 80s, kind of stupidly, really, because it really wasn't that, um, what do they call it, um, NPR, Nicaraguan Public Radio, you know, at a certain <laughs> point, you know, to be mean, you know, to say, like, and there was a little truth to that in the early days, because people were much younger and much more underdog-oriented and much more rah-rah, and maybe a little less, to be honest, you know, maybe a little less the news people that they are today, or that we have on staff today. Um, but that's long since been over. But yeah, new, what happened was it gave us a lot of publicity. The short version gave us a lot of publicity and did us a lot of good, because they didn't zero it out, you know. In the end, they didn't. And Newt, when I, if I may say, we met several times, went on to say he was on our air just yesterday. It was Newt, right? Yeah. yeah. I didn't. Hear, I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. Yesterday but we were elite media. Yeah, we were the elite media. Oh, I ha I'm sorry, I did not hear. <laughs> I was sleeping in myself. Um, <laughs> I was going to go back and listen, though, because he gave us an interview. It, you kind of feel like we know how bad off he is now because he wouldn't, has not been willing to give us an interview. So, but suddenly, <laughs> he's on NPR. That's like you can just kiss his campaign goodbye. You know, but he, he said, listen, on my way to work, I listened to NPR and appreciate it. This was in a speech in 2003. 
NPR is a lot less to the left or I've mellowed, said Newt, or some combination of the two. And he was a subscriber. Um, but, you know, it, it, it has some kind of charm to attack NPR. It has some, it does work to some small degree, it appears, because they keep coming back and doing it. I mean, they really, you know, there's like a 10 year thing or in every eight years you can count on it. And, and then they don't do it. They didn't zero us out this year either. I mean, we were not cut at all. In fact, we should be cut a little bit compared to everything out there. I don't mean should be, but we can expect to be because everything is going to be shrunk down a bit. But the big cut was in 1983 when Ronald Reagan or in the early days, when Ronald Reagan became president, he said, we should not be paying for public radio or TV. And so he wanted to zero out the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, which is the umbrella group. And in fact, he succeeded. He, the whole system changed. There was actually CPB funding. I, I don't know the exact amount, but it was most of the funding for NPR was, was coming from the federal government in the 70s. And there was corporate and, and then and when Reagan came in, he made good on, we're not going to fund you directly. And, but what happened was the system changed. So they sort of, the CPB money now goes to the stations. And stations get about 15% on average of what they need to run their stations from the CPB. And then some percentage of money comes to us. So one of the sort of, you know, comes to NPR. Well, they have to buy NPR station st shows because if they didn't run NPR shows, it, um, they'd make less money from listeners because listeners tune in to hear NPR shows. I mean, it's a simple dynamic. So it's a good deal all around. But um, when they talk about defunding NPR, they're never really defunding NPR per se because it was long ago, 30 years ago, that money, that direct cash went away, really. And now that it's just that it could hurt stations uh, a lot, especially small stations and struggling stations. So, but it still seems to be a thing to like, like hang over, you know, like it's a real good political thing. What okay. was your take on SNL's um, Sweaty Balls episode where, <laughs> where oh, basically I, they were ridiculing yeah. the extreme um, effetism of yeah. NPR? Uh, you know, I, you know, how can you not love being on Saturday Night Live, <laughs> you know, being made fun of? I don't know. The funniest one is the, was the food show and that really wasn't even NPR. That was K CRW originally. Um, what was it? Good Eats? What's it been called? Good, good Food. It wasn't us at all. It was the station. But the people, you know, media, uh, what do you call, you know, uh, what do you call, uh, the, the SNL people who live out here who would have heard KCRW picked it up at some point. And then I guess they were on PBS too, which I sort of missed the, the TV part. No, you know, sweaty balls. It, it's not <laughs> rough. <laughs> it's not that very accurate. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it, you know, so um, we have some funny, um, there's some funny ads they've done for us, ads and not ads, there's some funny funders that they've done then for the system that you hear sometimes. Um, so you can only thank them, let's just put it that way. So thank you all very much for having me. <laughs> it's really a pleasure. And, if I may, could I just quickly introduce two of the, Shannon Rhodes, who is our editor here in, in Los Angeles, and Nina Gregory, who is an, our other editor here in Los Angeles. And Nina and I, like I said, we get to work at midnight every night, and we, we're there for the, the long haul. And so, you know, special, and of course, I introduced Metal League. So um, it's really a pleasure for us to be here. <laughs>